Okay, again, a lot of what we talked about so far with isometrics and all that stuff would apply to the deadlift and a lot of what we're gonna talk about here would also apply to the bench press. So, first thing I'm gonna sort of talk about here real briefly is just evaluating qualifications. So, if um, someone's offering you advice or wanting to mentor you, let's look at why you'd say yes or why you'd say no, okay? So basically, we're going to talk about, the, we're, we're not life coaching here today too, too very much. Um, we can do that an hour after maybe, but not right now. So we're going to look at why would you listen to this person? Who is this person's mentors? Who have they trained with? So after talking to Troy at the break, I've learned he's trained with a lot of good Olympic lifters. So if I needed some Olympic lifting advice, I'd be willing to listen. You know, it's not like he just watched some YouTube video and all of a sudden thinks he's an expert. Okay, who is a person trained with? So if someone's, you know, trained with like, been mentored by Charles Poliquin, I'm probably gonna, you know, listen to what they have to say. What, then to the next step is, has that person that we're talking about within the strength world, have their clients had any success? You know, because you could be, actually have some good, good qualifications on paper and that your clients are not getting the results you want. The next step is, you could still be pretty good and the client's having some success, but the ultimate goal of every teacher is to have their students surpass them. So you want to make sure the person you're getting mentored is ultimately having their students surpass them. If I'm here saying, hey, I can make a million dollars, I'm gonna mentor everybody else how to get rich, but everybody here walks away making 150,000, that's good, but you're not beating the person that, you know, that told you, so that's ultimately what you want. And just their success all around and everything they're doing, you know, keep that in mind. Then educational background, whether it's like, you know, university education, if it makes sure it's legitimate, street education, whatever, but just education in general. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why to deadlift, even if we're not all powerlifters here, just why would you deadlift? Because I know, you know, some people are working at high schools as a strength coach or whatever. First reason I have, it's, it's a simple learning curve. Pretty much anybody can learn to deadlift pretty quickly. Does, you know, it's, it's the easiest of the three powerlifts to learn. It's gonna benefit strongman, general fitness, aesthetic mind of individuals, you know, and just sports in general. It, the deadlift's gonna force virtually every muscle in your body to work together. It's the ultimate posterior chain. What's the posterior chain? Back side of your body, very good. Okay, an ultimate grip developer if you're not using straps. It epitomizes functionality. I mean, because think about it, if you're you know, in a barroom brawl and it gets up close and you have to pick the person up, you're using the back side of the body to pick the person up in the front. That's functionality. So it can apply, you know, football tackling, whatever. Okay, it's the least inhibited, and I hate to use this term, but it's the least bastardized of all the powerlifts. There's no gear that's totally like ruined it. So if it's like, if somebody's competing in gear, they might only get like 10% more with a deadlift suit. So it hasn't been totally destroyed. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my personal struggle with the deadlift. It took me, um, I was pretty natural bench presser, but deadlift took me years and years to get to a world-class level. And what is, is it generally better to have short arms or long arms in the deadlift, anybody? Long. There you go. Last time I asked this question, everybody unanimously said short. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so this is like part of the reason I struggled. If you look at like, see, this is one of the best deadlifters of all time, Vincent Nello, look where the bar's locked out and like, look where it is on me. Yes, I mean, it's, you know, testicular friction, so to speak. <laughs> okay. So here's my experience with deadlift. Um, I've had the chance to train with two all-time world record holders and we'll talk about it a little bit. Not like the record for their federation, but actually like the world record holders. I've, my quest to get better in the deadlift was such a struggle, I actually traveled all over the United States to train with different people to learn how to deadlift better. You know, so I wasn't built to deadlift. And so my 810 deadlift, that's my proudest strength accomplishment even though you know, my bench press would be ranked higher on an all-time list. That, that's the one I had to work the hardest for, for. And since then, I've been able to have a chance, an opportunity to train 
numerous people that hold deadlift world records. So let's talk a little about the different types of deadlifts. Okay, we got a trap bar deadlift. This anybody here ever done the trap bar deadlift before? Yeah, we have one in there. You have one here? Yeah. Okay. Here's me actually doing a trap bar deadlift. This is about nine years ago. So unlike a regular barbell, you're actually going to stand here in the middle of the trap bar. How much was that, Josh? That was 840. This is what this was a straw man. I could have done more, as you'll see from the lift, but this is a straw man competition, so you you would actually get ranked off of by winning the event. So I only took two attempts. But I mean, if 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 he would have brought it, I, I mean, I had a lot more in there. Okay, so some of the advantages of the trap bar, or, oh, some of the, I don't want to say advantages, difference is the trap bar. It's sort of like a squat deadlift hybrid. That's why a lot of people like it. It's the training economy. It's very similar to both lifts. It's great for symmetrical development because you're standing in the middle, you're gripping it with a neutral grip, making it also really good for shrugs. It's more quad dominant, so it's a little less hips and lower back. And it's believed by some to be safer. And I'll say that could be true to a point, but with really good explosive athletes, it, it's not always the case because what happens, they pull so explosively at the top, it like tips forward and things like that. So for the average person off the street, I can go for that. For the cream of the crop, you know, I'm not, I ain't buying it, put it that way. So this can also be one of, a good way to do this is for like sports is to use it for explosive jumps. So what you do is load like a light weight, do a couple vertical jumps with it, set the weight down, step out, then do a vertical jump as high as you can without it. So it's very similar to what we were talking about earlier. We do a heavy weight and the bench press followed by a light explosive set after, same concept. Okay, next is sumo deadlift. Any, most people familiar with the sumo deadlift? This is uh, one of my client, Matt Mills. He's, all, he's only lightweight strongman ever to place at the Arnold. Here's him doing a 800 sumo deadlift. Weighing at 242. So see his hands are between his legs. That's why it's called sumo, like, like the a sumo wrestler stance, so. Okay, so some of the differences with a sumo deadlift are it's more quad dominant really hits the glutes pretty good. It's a shorter range of motion. It's gonna be, if, if performed correctly, it's less stress on your lower back. I mean, Tina, you've switched to sumo recently. What, what do you think? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like it's helped you. So one of the, the, the least, I don't know why this, um, actually got an article coming out next month. Anybody remember Black Belt Magazine? Like the only traditional karate magazine still going? holding strong, not, not selling out to MMA. But anyways, um, that's uh, what we're talking about in there is the, like for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or any of those things in the guard position, that, that, that adductor strength that you're gonna build in a sumo deadlift is a very, very, very good transference. I don't know why that's ignored by people, but it is. And um, this is really good for conventional deadlifters to work in the off season, just to increase leg drive, strengthen, you know, the glutes, things like that. And, um, we're gonna get into, we're gonna mainly discuss the conventional deadlift today though. Okay, so here's a picture of a conventional deadlift, okay? That's one of my clients, Brandon Cass right there. He's um, by far got the biggest uh, deadlift of any masters in his weight class. He's over 40. Yes. Did you ever try to uh, sumo? Yeah, actually my experience was that my first 500 was conventional. My first 600 was sumo, my first 700 was sumo, first 800 conventional. Why back and forth? Um, because sometimes it felt like um, when I get heavier, it'd be easier to get down okay. with the sumo because generally a sumo, I should have said this earlier, is gonna be a more squatty body type. Sure. So when I'm leaner, I could deadlift. So for 700 and 800, I weighed the same, but I was a lot less fat when I pulled the 800. Good question though. So this is just observation, but say you're teaching someone to deadlift, mm -hmm. um, 
and maybe they're like most people, they're quad dominant. Would a natural progression be to teach them um, trap bar, deadlift, sumo, and then reg? I think another one you can do is also start them a little bit elevated because they're generally going to get it if you put it like say a few inches higher. And that's that's another thing I do with a lot of my taller clients. Like that guy I showed you, Tom Haviland, the the rest pause training thing. The guy put on like 100 pounds. I barely ever have him pull off the floor because he's six seven, but you know it transfers over pretty good. So you're like rack pulls off the floor. Not rack pulls. Generally, we're gonna, it's box pulls because the flex of the bar is a lot different. So for powerlifting, it actually matters. Bodybuilding, yeah, rack pulls. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the deadlift mentors I've had and what I've had a chance to learn because I've learned a lot from each one. The first one is uh, Steve Hall. Uh, Steve Hall was not built to pull. He had a terrible build to deadlift, but he ended up finally deadlifting 700 pounds at 48 years old um, with a terrible build for it. And what I learned from Steve was basically, again, we're not talking about general fitness and safety, like to be as strong as possible we would always err to the side of being aggressive. And he always, before I would go deadlift, would talk about having controlled rage and committing to the pool. Basically, he'd mean by that is he'd tell me, I want your back to break before you don't get that lift. So like the lift was already made. When I'd walk up to the bar, the last, Steve actually passed away. Um, and, um, you know, it was unfortunate. It was, you know, he wasn't living the healthiest lifestyle, but, um, Anyways, the last time I saw him alive was at the last powerlifting meet that I did. And I was going up to do my final deadlift. I'd missed it on the second attempt. And the person right before me had actually tore his bicep. Yeah, I see you, you were there. Yeah. Tore his bicep right before that. So I was looking at the meet director. I kind of looked down at him like, dude, don't stop this meet. I'm going to deadlift. You know, I was trying not to cause a scene. But then Steve looked down at him and I like, looked him in the eye and said, He's effing roadkill, get the weight. And that was like my last memory of Steve. <laughs> that was his attitude. Like, I mean, he gets so mad at people. At the, I've seen him like throw plates at people at the gym. I mean, I don't know how he wasn't in prison, but it was a total like just commit to the pool. Okay, so then uh, we'll move on now to George Brink. Have anybody here ever heard of George Brink? He's one of the all-time world record holders I had a chance to, to train with. He's the only person at least at the time, I don't know of anybody since then, to pull over um, 800 that's 50 years old or older. And um, what happened there was um, I saw him at a meet and I basically, um, I basically like called a bunch of people to get his phone number and stalked him and made him agree to train with me. <laughs> and he's like, fine, if you help me with my bench press, I'll help you deadlift. I said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So after I hunted him down and you know, basically got him to agree to train with me, I learned a ton from him. I, what I learned from George was a very, high volume approach. He did a ton of sets, ton of reps, total throwback ball buster lifter. He'd be, our training cycle, the first time I trained with him was um, going from, you know, like just a couple singles to we started, we did seven weeks of five sets of 10 on the deadlift, or a stiff legged deadlift, no belt off a three inch deficit, no deloads. Next we go seven weeks off a three inch deficit, five sets of five, no deloads. Then we went seven weeks of heavy, doubles, triples, and singles. And my deadlift wasn't moving at all. It went up about 50 pounds after that. So it was a start. So since then, I've used that same sort of cycle with some people. We've done a ton of modifications with much more singles um, when we got to the deficits and then the actual heavy deadlifts. And of course, throwing in deload weeks in there. But I mean, I probably put on like 15 pounds during that training cycle without even changing my diet or anything. That's, that's how effective it was. And what I also learned from George is he pulled big when it counted. He was not like some gym lifter that like would, you know, lift some huge amount of weight, show up, you know, to the meet and kind of do less. I mean, his best deadlift ever in the gym was 725 and he ended up deadlifting 804 in a contest. And he made a hell of a run at 821, it was really close. So, and then another thing I learned as we talked about earlier from George is why are we doing this? So strap up, you strap up when needed. So I'll, you know, have somebody come up to me sometime and be like, hey, you know, I was doing shrugs, but I, you know, I couldn't hold onto the bar anymore. Like, why are you doing shrugs? Is it for your grip or for your traps? You know, if you're doing it for your grip, you know, that, that's whatever. But if you're trying to build your, you know, you're trying to build that, you want to build your traps or work your back on rows, you need to strap up. And that, that's what I learned from him. So. 
obviously you can't you know just do that on all your deadlifts and everything's gonna be fine you're gonna have to work your grip but it's not just like you know i'm gonna sacrifice my back my traps in the name of not using straps okay paul leonard does anybody remember him he lived around here for all you remember him steve okay um and um just a side note of what, like a lot of these people, everybody I know that's been a good death lift has been fairly crazy. And both Steve and George Brink not knowing each other were both dismissed from their law enforcement job for collaborating too closely with the Hells Angels. <laughs> <laughs> so like no joke, the same person too, and it's, they finally met through him. But um, so anyways, um, Paul was, um, he, he's another law enforcement officer actually, he, he's not dismissed though, but anyways, he lived around here and what I learned from him was very methodical programming. You know, everything was planned ahead of time, there was no haphazard to it. He was again a meat performer, he'd always lift more at the meats. And the main thing I learned from Paul was the importance of deloading. Because I'd only heard about it before, you know, that was kind of, I was like, this is lame, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then I actually saw somebody strong doing it and he kind of taught me some parameters on how to do that. So I'm, I was really thankful for a chance to, you know, train with all these people. The next one was Art Labar. Again, there's more of a thing learned from him was being fearless with any weight. I mean, he would get, went to one meet, I think he was maybe 725 would have, should he pulled. He went up from 605 to 70, or 606 to 705. He needed 804 to win and he damn near got the weight. I mean, that was so far out of his capabilities but he was fearless, he had balls of steel, he was scared of nothing, and that's the kind of attitude it's gonna to take to pull world-class weight. And the other thing I learned from Art is, um, again, everybody's good deadlifter, is kind of crazy. I know he had um, some issues with his hand, he couldn't really grip anything, and uh, basically the word in the street was he, like had damaged it, in, I don't know, some kind of tavern altercation or something of that nature, and he couldn't really close his hand very well, so he'd have to pull the weight up really fast, or he'd drop it, so, I learned that really the importance of speed deadlifting from him without him really cueing it or knowing it. The next person I had the, the chance to train with that held all time world records, uh, Gary Frank. Does anybody know who that is? Yeah. He doesn't have the all time world record anymore, but here's when he pulled a 926. And he was not a deadlift specialist either. Actually, none of these people were. So basically, I had a chance to move down. Yeah. I, um, I had uh, my deadlift was still struggling, and um, you know George was getting out of lifting. So I saw Gary Frank at a WPO meet, and he's like, um, "Why don't you move down to Louisiana and train train with me?" Then you know I think he didn't think I was serious, and there I was, showed up. So then at that point it was on. And anyways, I thought I was gonna go down there and learn some sort of magical training program from Gary. Didn't happen, but I learned some great lessons from him. The m number one lesson was in the importance of cueing speed. That was his main thing. He'd always say speed, speed, speed. And it'd follow it with like a really explicit bad acronym I can't really use here, but after that. So we would always talk about rolling the bar. You know, when you're deadlifting, like say, instead of starting with the bar statically, kind of, you know, start with your butt up and roll the bar in and pull it that way. And I'd been told by some powerlifters in California that weren't very successful you know, don't do that, don't do that. It's, people don't do that. And then Gary Frank just looked at me. He's like, he always said, bra. He's like, bra? He's like, they ain't deadlifting 900. I said, that's right. <laughs> so then he's like, we don't, that's what we do is we try to drop our butt and create a pseudo eccentric phase of the deadlift lift to help spring the weight up. And, you know, basically what I learned from Gary is there is a, an element of style to each lift. It's not like you can just define a lift textbook style for everybody and say, oh, this is how everybody does it, you know, do it that way. There is an individualized style element. And his famous quote was, you always say, you talk to 10 different guys about technique, you're gonna hear 10 different things. But if you build strength, you build power, your lifts are gonna go up. Gary trained, he wasn't a real high volume guy, but he trained extremely heavy. He literally maxed out every workout leading up to a meet. And that, you know, so I definitely picked up going heavy there. I wouldn't necessarily recommend maxing out every single week, but you know, I've seen worse things in action, put it that way. So Ed Cohn, I talked to him all the time and I would have actually moved to train with him, but it was a choice between that and Gary Frank and I'd rather be in Louisiana than Chicago. So that, that was the only 
real reason because it would have been great to go with him too. But um, I actually used to talk to I still talk to him quite a lot, but I used to talk to him at least a couple times a week. And what I learned from Ed was he's very methodical. Okay. Ed also learned how to work around injuries. Does anybody know that he holds a world record in the 220 class? Anybody know how he pulled it? Sumo or conventional? Anybody? Sumo. Sumo, yep. He holds a world record, in the two, or did hold the world record until a couple months ago in the 242. Does anybody know he pulled that? Okay. Conventional. He had a, you know, he tore his groin instead of, you know, crime big alligator tillers. He just got it done and switched to conventional. So basically, you know, there was transference between styles and he would even train when he was training sumo. He would trade conventional in the off season. Like that guy I showed you guys, Matt Mills. He, we only trained conventional, I mean sumo, excuse me, like the last four to five weeks. We Conventional the rest of the year. So there is a pretty good transference and also works the other way where you can train for a conventional deadlift and still pull sumo in the off season. Okay, another thing I learned was uh, training Olympic pause squats. So that's a real narrow stance, deep pause squat. That seemed to really help, uh, help initiate some leg drive in the deadlift. And then individualization, because the, probably the highest compliment I personally got before I was really doing this full time was when Ed Cohn called me up and asked me to design a training program for one of the guys he was working out with. And it basically is like, what we're doing here is not working. I need what you're going to do. Because he was totally into individualization. So if he, if you said I'm deadlifting 15 times a week, but it's, got, it's gone up 100 pounds in the last eight weeks, he would say, continue deadlifting 15 times a week. He's not like, you know, ingrained to just one way of thinking. He's all about what works the best. On your term, Olympic pause squats, is that a high bar squat? Exactly. Okay. Yep.